Welcome to Swift Current Museum's Lunch and Learn for October 2020. I'd like to thank the City of Swift Current and Sask Culture Sask Lotteries for making this program possible. I'd also like to acknowledge that we are on Treaty 4 land. Today's Lunch and Learn is a brief history of plagues, pandemics, and other mass infections. A new virus strain or subtype that easily transmits between humans can cause a pandemic. Bacteria that become resistant to antibiotic treatment may also be behind the rapid spread. Sometimes pandemics occur when new diseases develop the ability to spread rapidly, such as the Black Death or bubonic plague. Humans may have little or no immunity against a new virus. Often, a new virus cannot spread between animals and people. However, if the disease changes or mutates, it may start to spread easily and a pandemic may result. A pandemic can also increase the pressure on healthcare systems by raising the demand for certain treatments. <clears throat> And here we see the great plague of Athens from 430 BC. A molecular DNA study of teeth from several individuals interned in the Karameikos mass burial showed that the plague was enteric typhoid fever. Typhoid fever is a bacterial infection due to a specific type of salmonella growing in the intestines and blood, causing symptoms 6 to 30 days after exposure. Often there is a gradual onset of a high fever over several days. This is commonly accompanied by weakness, abdominal pain, constipation, headaches, and mild vomiting. Without treatment, symptoms can last weeks or months. Other people may carry the bacterium without being affected, but they are still able to spread the disease to others. Typhoid is spread by eating or drinking food or water contaminated with the feces of an infected person. Risk factors include poor sanitation and poor hygiene. Unlike other strains of salmonella, no animal carriers of typhoid are known. The Great Plague of Athens swept through Athens in 430 BC, the second year of the Peloponnesian War, claiming around 100,000 lives. While the war would not end for nearly 26 years after the first wave of sickness, there is little doubt that this plague changed the course of the war and planted the seeds that would weaken and then destroy Athenian democracy. The best ancient account of the Great Plague can be found in Thucydides' history of the Peloponnesian War. Thucydides was an Athenian general exiled from Athens after being blamed for a disastrous defeat. He also survived the plague making his narration of the disease's symptoms and sensations not only reliable, but quite visceral. As few others have before or since, Thucydides understood the ways in which fear and self-interest, when they are submitted to, guide individual motives and consequently the fate of nations. Thucydides was not concerned just with the ways in which poor urban planning caused the death of thousands of his countrymen. He was as much a moral critic as a political one. In his narration of the plague's devastation, he took careful tally of instances of selflessness and courage and those of selfishness and cowardice. For Thucydides, the death and suffering of a great epidemic, just like war, tests the moral health of individuals and of societies. And a people who are not morally strong when they become afraid, quickly slip into lawlessness and sacrilege. What is also clear is that Thucydides did not think this collapse into immorality was simply a result of the plague. He wrote, Men who had hitherto concealed what they took pleasure in, 
now grew bolder. The Antonine Plague took place between 165 and 180, with a death toll of 5 million people. <clears throat> the Antonine Plague was brought to the Roman Empire by troops returning from campaigns in the Near East. It was either smallpox or measles. Symptoms were fever, chills, upset stomach and diarrhea, along with black pox over their bodies, both inside and out that scabbed over and left disfiguring scars. Some would cough up or excrete scabs that had formed inside their body. Smallpox killed massively, gruesomely, and in waves. Archaeologists still find amulets and little stones carved by people desperately trying to ward off the pestilence. Romans first responded to plagues by calling on the gods. Romans reinforced struggling communities. Emperor Marcus Aurelius responded to the deaths of so many soldiers by recruiting slaves and gladiators to the legions. He filled the abandoned farmsteads and depopulated cities by inviting migrants from outside the empire to settle within its boundaries. Cities that lost large numbers of aristocrats replaced them by various means even filling vacancies in their councils with the sons of freed slaves. The empire kept going, despite death and terror on a scale no one had ever seen. Cassius Dio also believed that the trauma of living through plague can be overcome if a well-governed society works together to recover and rebuild. And the society that emerges from these efforts can become stronger than what came before. From 1735 to 1737, Japan suffered a smallpox epidemic with a death toll of one million. Increased contact between Japan and the Asian mainland is blamed for this epidemic. A fisherman apparently contracted the illness after being stranded on the Korean peninsula. By 736, many land tenants in Kyushu were either dying or forsaking their crops leading to poor agricultural yields and ultimately famine. Adult mortality has been estimated at 25 to 35 percent of Japan's entire population. The plague of Justinian, which took place between 541 and 542, was the Yersinia pestis bacteria, what we common know, commonly known as as the plague. Um, the death toll was 30 to 50 million people. Plague is a contagious bacterial disease. The symptoms are fever and delirium, typically with the formation of bubose, in which case it is bubonic plague, and sometimes infection of the lungs, called pneumonic plague. It causes a painful, relatively quick death that almost often includes vomiting, bleeding, and gangrene of the skin. The plague is transmitted from animals to humans through flea bites. Justinian's plague came from China and Northeast India via land and sea trade routes to Egypt where it entered the Byzantine Empire through Medita Mediterranean ports. Egypt, a recently conquered land, was paying tribute to Emperor Justinian in grain. Greek scholar and historian Procopius laid blame for the outbreak on the Emperor Justinian, declaring him to either be a devil or invoking God's punishment for his evil ways. Some historians found that this event could have dashed Emperor Justinian's efforts to reunite the western and eastern remnants of the Roman Empire, marking the beginning of the Dark Ages. The plague decimated Constantinople, Constantinople and spread like wildfire across Europe, Asia, North Africa and Arabia, killing an estimated 30 to 50 million people, perhaps half of the world's population. 
The Black Death took place between 1347 and 1351, with a death toll of 200 million people. The most fatal pandemic in recorded history was the Black Death, which killed an estimated 75 to 200 million people in the 14th century. The most popular theory of how the plague ended is through the implementation of quarantines. The uninfected remained in their homes and only left when necessary. Those who could afford to left the more densely populated areas and lived in greater isolation. The practice of quarantine began during the 14th century in an effort to protect coastal cities from plague epidemics. Port authorities required ships arriving in Venice from infected ports to sit at anchor for 40 days before landing. The origin of the word quarantine came from the Italian quaranta giorni, or 40 days. New World smallpox outbreak from 1520 onwards had a death toll of 56 million people. Explorers arrived in the New World bearing more than just turnips and grapes. They also brought smallpox, measles, and other viruses for which the New World inhabitants had no immunity. People did not show symptoms for two weeks or so after contracting it. As European fur trading posts moved west, so did the virus. From 1779 to 1783, smallpox spread to areas that now form parts of Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta. Some communities of Plains Indigenous peoples lost 75% or more of their members. It is estimated that more than half of First Nations people living along the Saskatchewan River, territory of the uh, Blackfoot, Soto, Assiniboine, and Nitsitapi died of smallpox or epidemic-related starvation. In 1838, a second smallpox epidemic struck the prairies. The epidemic began with an infected person aboard the American Fur Company steamship on the Missouri River. The captain refused to halt or quarantine the ship. The virus eventually reached Forts Union and Mackenzie in what is now North Dakota and Montana. Traders representing various nations, including the Assiniboine and Blackfoot, frequented the affected American trading posts. Hudson's Bay Company employees started giving inoculations and teaching the technique to others after the two prairie epidemics. Smallpox changed power structures and alliances, as well as land use and occupancy. Some distinct cultural groups disappeared as almost all of their members died. Métis communities in what is now central Alberta experienced a smallpox outbreak in 1870. St. Albert's Métis population declined by roughly 37 percent that year. In 1959, the World Health Organization initiated a plan to rid the world of smallpox. Unfortunately, unfortunately, this global eradication campaign suffered from lack of funds, personnel, and commitment from countries, as well as a shortage of vaccine donations. Despite their best efforts, smallpox was still widespread in 1966, causing regular outbreaks in multiple countries across South America, Africa, and Asia. On May 8, 1980, the 30th Third World Health Assembly officially declared the world free of this disease. Eradication of smallpox is considered the biggest achievement in international public health. Scientists and public health officials determined that there was still a need to perform research using the variola virus. There are two locations where variola virus is officially stored and handled under WHO supervision the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta, Georgia, and the State Research Center of Virology and Biotechnology in Kosovo, Russia. 
were seven cholera pandemics running from 1817 to the present, with a death toll of more, toll of more than one million people. Few societies have been spared by this highly infectious bacteria, which is transmitted through feces-contaminated water and caused severe diarrhea and vomiting. The epidemic that swept London in 1854 spawned the sort of epi epidemiological investigations that take place in disease outbreaks today. That's thanks to John Snow, an English physician who almost single-handedly took on the bacteria. While some scientists suspected cholera was transmitted through the air, Snow thought otherwise. Through carefully mapping the outbreak, he found that everyone affected had a single connection in common. They all retrieved water from the local Broad Street pump. He ordered the pump handle turned off and people stopped getting sick. There have been seven cholera pandemics since the early 1800s that have cost the lives of over a million people. <clears throat> From 1817 to 1823, uh, starting in the Ganges River Delta, colonization and trade carried the disease to Asia, the Middle East, Af Eastern Africa, and the Mediterranean coast. 10,000 British troops died, so at least 100,000 civilians are presumed to have died. Between 18 and 29 and 1849, also starting in India, it reached Russia in 1830, then continued to Finland and Poland. A two-year outbreak in England in 1831 killed 22,000 people. 1852 to 1859, again starting in India, it spread through Asia, Europe, North America, and Africa. In 1863 to 1869, it, uh, cholera epidemic began in India. Indian Muslim pilgrims visiting Mecca spread it to the Middle East. Uh, 30,000 of the 90,000 pilgrims perished, and the disease spread to Europe, Africa, and North America. Between 1881 and 1896, also originating in India, and spread through Asia, Africa, South America, and parts of France and Germany. 200,000 people died in Russia between 1893 and 1894, and 90,000 in Japan between 1887 and 1889. Quarantine measures based on the findings of Jon Snow kept cholera out of Britain and the U.S. In 1892, a Ukrainian bacteria bacteriologist named Valdemar Hafkin developed a human vaccine. Between 1899 and 1923, more than 800,000 people died in India before spreading to the Middle East, North Africa, Russia, and parts of Europe. Between 1961 in, and the present, um, this uh, pandemic began in Indonesia, spreading across Asia and the Middle East, reaching Africa by 1971. In 1973, it spread to Italy. Outbreaks continue during natural disasters and wars in third world countries. Modern day sewage and water treatment systems have virtually eliminated cholera from developed countries. The third plague <clears throat> took place in 1885 with a death toll of 12 million in China and India. The third pl plague pandemic was a major bu bubonic plague pandemic that began in Yunnan, China in 1885. This episode spread to all inhabited continents and led to more than 12 million deaths in India and China with about 10 million killed in India alone. According to the World Health Organization, the pandemic was considered active until 1960, when worldwide casualties dropped to 200 per year. Plague deaths have continued at a lower level for every year since. The Great Plague of Marseille was the last major outbreak of bubonic plague in Western Europe. 
Arriving in Marseille, France in 1720, the disease killed a total of 100,000 people, 50,000 in the city during the next two years, and another 50,000 to the north in surrounding provinces and towns. The last urban plague epidemic in the United States occurred in Los Angeles from 1924 through 1925. Plague then spread from urban rats to rural and rodent species, species and became entrenched in many areas of the western United States. Since that time, plague has occurred as scattered cases in rural areas. The most popular theory of how the plague ended is through the implementation of quarantines. The uninfected would typically remain in their homes and only leave when it was necessary while those who could afford to do so would leave the more densely populated areas and live in greater isolation. Plague still exists. It caused 171 deaths in Madagascar in 2018, where person-to-person -person transmission through coughing was a factor. In 2020, China locked down some communities in Mongolia because of plague. During the 1800s, um, yellow fever plagued the United States with a death toll of 100 to 150,000. Yellow fever is transmitted by the bite of an infected mosquito. It gets its name from the yellowing of the skin and eyes that occurs when the virus attacks the liver. In mild cases, yellow fever causes a fever, headache, nausea, and vomiting. But yellow fever can become more serious, causing heart, liver, and kidney problems along with bleeding. Up to 50% of people with the more severe form of yellow fever die from the disease. This viral infection regularly found in South America and Sub-Saharan -Sub Africa. In 1793, yellow fever swept through Philadelphia, then the capital of the U.S., killing roughly 10% of the population. President George Washington and Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson hightailed it out of town, ultimately setting on Washington as the nation's capital. Back then, nobody knew exactly how and why people came down with yellow fever. It wasn't until 1900 that U.S. Army researchers pinpointed mosquitoes as the transmission vector of the disease. Today, yellow fever can be prevented by a vaccine. <clears throat> the, between 1889 and 1890, the Russian flu, believed to be of H2N2, or avian origin, had a death toll of one million people. Scientists have suggested that the Great Russian Flu of 1890, which killed Queen Victoria's grandson, was a COVID-type virus that could be the forerunner of today's global health crisis. The Great Russian Flu pandemic of the early 1890s was a deadly influenza pandemic which killed around one million people worldwide and struck all levels of society, including British politicians. They believe the pandemic was caused by a coronavirus which jumped from cows to humans. <clears throat> the Spanish flu of 1918-1919 was an H1N1 virus from pigs. The death toll, toll was 40 to 50 million people. The Spanish flu pandemic claimed 50 million lives. Experts consider it the most severe pandemic in history. The Spanish flu got its name not because it originated in Spain, but because it was World War I and Spain was the only country being honest about the toll the pandemic took on the country. It came in two waves, starting in 1918 and ending in 1920. Isolation, masks, and quarantines were used to slow down transmission. During the 1918 influenza pandemic, masks became the go-to means of stopping the spread of infection to the public. 
Masks became mandatory in San Francisco in September of 1918, and those who didn't comply faced fines, imprisonment, and the threat of having their names printed in newspapers as mask slackers. Newspapers also printed instructions on how to make masks at home. People even got creative with masks, with the Seattle Daily Times running an article entitled Influenza Veils Set New Fashion in October of 1918. As soldiers returned home across Canada, they brought the Spanish flu with them. Swift Current closed public places and cancelled events. The Lyric Theatre was used as an isolation unit. At the height of the local contagion, about four people per day were being interred. <clears throat> Between 1957 and 1958, the Asian flu, an H2N2 virus, had a death toll of 1.1 million. Dr. Morris Hilleman was working at the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research in 1957 when he read a New York Times article about a nasty flu outbreak in Hong Kong that mentioned glassy-eyed children at the cl clinic. Something about their eyes tipped him off, according to Smithsonian Magazine. His gut told him that these deaths meant the next big flu pandemic. He requested samples of the virus to be shipped to U.S. drug makers right away so that they could get a vaccine ready. Though 70,000 people in the United States ultimately died, some predicted that the U.S. death toll would have reached 100 million, or pardon me, 1 million without the vaccine that Hillman called for. Immunity to this strain of influenza A, H2N2, was rare in people less than 65 years of age, and a pandemic was predicted. In preparation, vaccine production began in late May 1957, and health officials increased surveillance for flu outbreaks. Unlike the virus that caused the 1918 pandemic, the 1957 pandemic virus was quickly identified due to advances in scientific technology. A vaccine was available in limited supply by August 1957. This virus came to the United States quietly, with small outbreaks over the summer of 1957. When children went back to school in the fall, they spread the disease in classrooms and brought it home to their families. Infection rates were highest among school children, young adults, and pregnant women. Most influenza and pneumonia-related deaths occurred between September and March 1958. The elderly then had the highest rates of death. <clears throat> By December 1957, the worst seemed to be over. But during January and February of 1958, there was another wave of ill illness among the elderly. This is an example of the potential second wave of infections that can develop during a pandemic. The disease infects one group of people first, infections appear to decrease, and then infections increase in a different part of the population. <clears throat> Between 1968 and 1970, the H3N2 virus, the Hong Kong flu, had a death toll of one million people. The Hong Kong flu was a Category 2 flu pandemic caused by the strain of H3N2 descended from H2N2 by antigenic shift. Between 1968 and 1970, it killed between 1 and 4 million people. <clears throat> the only precautions taken were washing hands and staying home when sick. In 1968, people were confident with all the advances in medicine. Measles, mumps, chickenpox, scarlet fever, and polio had all been brought under control. A common belief was that getting viruses strengthened one's immune system. <clears throat> the Kong, Kong flu also arrived at a particularly volatile moment in history. There was a race to land a man on the moon and political assassinations and sexual liberation and the civil rights movement. Without 24-7 news coverage and social media vying for our attention, 
a new strain of flu could hardly compete for the public's attention. If people in 1968 had been told to stay home, it's unlikely they would have protested. Dining out was a rare indulgence for most American families then. Today, we spend as much money eating out as we do preparing food at home. <clears throat> From 1981 to the present, um, we have had the HIV AIDS uh, pandemic uh, which is a virus stemming from chimpanzees and the death toll stands at 25 to 35 million. Acquired immunodeficiency syndrome is a chronic potentially life-threatening condition caused by the human immunodeficiency virus HIV. By damaging your immune system HIV interferes with your body's ability to fight infection and disease. HIV is a sexually transmitted transmitted infection. It can also be spread by contact with infected blood or from a mother to child during pregnancy, childbirth, or breastfeeding. Without medication, it may take years before HIV weakens your immune system to the point that you have AIDS. There's no cure for HIV AIDS, but medications can dramatically slow the progression of the disease. These drugs have reduced AIDS deaths in many developed nations. <clears throat> the primary infection, acute HIV, um, people develop a flu-like illness within two to four weeks after the virus enters the body. This illness, which might last for a few weeks, has symptoms including, including fever, headache, muscle aches and joint pain, rash, sore throat and painful mouth sores, swollen lymph glands, mainly on the neck, diarrhea, weight loss, cough, and night sweats. These symptoms can be so mild that you might not even notice them. However, the amount of virus in your bloodstream at this time is very high. As a result, the infection spreads more easily during primary infection than during the next stage. <clears throat> uh, clinical latent infection, or chronic HIV, in this stage, HIV is still present in the body in white blood cells. However, many people may not have any symptoms or infections during this time. This stage can last for many years, but some people develop more severe disease sooner. The virus continues to multiply and destroy your immune cells, leading to mild infections or chronic signs and symptoms like fever, fatigue, swollen lymph nodes, which is often one of the first signs of HIV infection, diarrhea, weight loss, oral yeast infection, shingles, or pneumonia. Left untreated, HIV typically turns into AIDS in about eight to 10 years. Thanks to better antiviral treatments, most people with HIV in developing countries do not develop AIDS. When AIDS occurs, the immune system has been severely damaged the patient will be more likely to develop opportunistic infections or opportunistic cancers, diseases that would not usually cause illness in a person with a healthy immune system. Often, AIDS stigma is expressed in conjunction with homosexuality, bisexuality, promiscuity, prostitution, and intravenous drug use. However, the dominant mode of spread uh, worldwide for HIV remains heterosexual transmission. <clears throat> Between 2009 and 2010, we had the H1N1 swine flu, which uh, came from pigs, and it had a death toll of 200,000 people. Swine flu was an influenza pandemic that lasted for about 19 months and was the second of two pandemics involving H1N1 influenza virus, the first being the Spanish flu epidemic. It was the world's most recent pandemic before COVID-19. Up to 21% of the world's population were infected. H1N1 flu is called swine flu because in the past, people who caught it had been in direct contact with pigs. That changed several years ago when a new virus emerged that spread among people who had not been near pigs. 
The swine flu was a mixture of several different flu strains that had never been seen together. The virus appeared to be a new strain of H1N1, which resulted from a previous triple reassortment of bird, swine, and human flu viruses that further combined with the Eurasian pig flu virus. Most of those infected by spine, swine flu were children and young adults. This was an unusual and characteristic feature of the H1N1 pandemic. The pneumonia caused by flu can be either direct viral pneumonia or a secondary bacterial pneumonia. A November 2009 New England Journal of Medicine article recommended that flu patients whose chest x-ray indicates pneumonia receive both antivirals and antibiotics. In particular, it is a warning sign if a child seems to be getting better and then relapses with a high fever, as this relapse may be bacterial pneumonia. Between 2000 and 2003, we experienced SARS, Severe Acute Respiratory Syn Syndrome, and it was a coronavirus uh, thought to come from bats and civets. SARS had a death toll of 770. SARS was caused by a previously unknown type of coronaviruses. <clears throat> Normally, coronaviruses cause mild to moderate upper respiratory symptoms, such as the common cold. It was spread through close contact with someone infect infected with the SARS coronavirus. Examples of close contact included living in the same household, providing to someone care to someone with SARS, or having direct contact with respiratory secretions and body fluids of someone affected by SARS. The symptoms of SARS resembled those of many other respiratory infections, such as influenza. This meant that doctors were not able to diagnose SARS based on symptoms alone. People at risk for developing SARS had a fever over 38 degrees Celsius and a cough or breathing difficulty. A chest x-ray that showed a condition consistent with SARS infection like pneumonia or respiratory distress system and no other cause of illness being found. <clears throat> People were very concerned about SARS, possibly in part because it was so difficult to diagnose. SARS was a relatively rare disease. At the end of the epidemic in June 2003, the incidence was 8,422 cases, with a case fatality rate of 11%. No cases of SARS have been reported worldwide since 2004. In 2019, the related virus strain, <clears throat> Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2, um, was discovered. This new strain causes COVID-19, a disease which brought the COVID-19 pandemic. Between 2014 and 2016, <clears throat> the Ebola virus had a death toll of 11,000 people. Viral hemorrhagic fevers, including those that the Ebola and Marburg viruses cause, can become pandemics, but close contact is necessary for these diseases to spread. The largest Ebola epidemic took place in Liberia, Guinea, and Sierra Leone from 2014 to 2015. There were also cases reported in Nigeria, Mali, Europe, and the United States. 28,616 people were suspect, suspected or confirmed of being infected. 11,310 people died. <clears throat> Significant efforts to contain the spread prevented Ebola from turning into a pandemic, even though some people developed the over infection overseas. Ebola resurfaced in the Democratic Republic of Congo in 2020. Modern surveillance systems and an experimental vaccine offer hope that authorities can deal with future outbreaks swiftly, increasing the chances of disease containment. From 2015 to the present, one virus you may not have heard of is the MERS virus, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, also known as camel flu. Um, with a death toll of 850 people. 
<clears throat> is a viral respiratory infection caused by the MERS coronavirus. Symptoms may range from none to mild to severe. Typical symptoms include fever, cough, diarrhea, and shortness of breath. The disease is usually more severe in those with other health problems. About 35% of those who are diagnosed from the disease, with the disease die from it. The first identified case occurred in 20, 2012 in Saudi Arabia. Most cases have occurred in the Arabian Peninsula. About 2,500 cases have been reported as of January 2020. About 35% of those who are diagnosed with the disease die from it. Larger outbreaks have occurred in South Korea in 2015 and in Saudi Arabia in 2018. Preventative measures include hand washing and avoiding contact with camels and camel products. <clears throat> From 2019 to the present, um, we have COVID-19, another co coronavirus, uh, its source is unknown. Um, originally, they thought bats. Now they're thinking it's more likely to have pangolins. And the death toll, as per August of 2020, was 848,000. Originating in Wuhan, China, COVID-19 is spread to all continents except Antarctica. The death toll is not as high as the Spanish flu, and we can thank modern medical practices for helping to lower the number. We still not, do not know about the long-term effects on survivors of the virus, and we do not have a vaccine, and we do not know what the virus plans to do next. <clears throat> Regionally, over the years, we have been plagued by typhoid, smallpox, Spanish flu, and polio. The first hospital built in 1913 had an isolation house to quarantine contagious patients. During the Spanish flu pandemic, the Lyric Theater was an isolation house for local patients. The hospital had iron lungs for critically ill polio patients. One man told me that as a boy, he had an iron lung parked in his room. He was told that it was being stored there, but in fact, they were afraid that he might need it. So what lessons have we learned uh, from all of this over the centuries? <clears throat> Number one is quarantine. The first quarantine was passed into law in the port city of Ragusa, today's Dubrovnik, on July 27, 1377, during the bubonic plague or Black Death. It stipulated those who come from plague-infested areas shall not enter uh, Ragusa or its district unless they spend a month on the island of Mercan or in the town of Kavtat for the purpose of disinfection. Doctors at the time observed that the spread of the Black Death could be slowed by isolating individuals. Quarantine played a large role in how cities responded to the outbreak of the 1918 Spanish flu following the return of soldiers from World War I. Philadelphia became a test case in what not to do when 20, 72 hours after holding the ill-fated Liberty Loan Parade in September, the city's 31 hospitals were at capacity following the super spreader event. <clears throat> Number two. Socially distant food and drink pickup. COVID-19 was not the first pandemic to strike Italy. During the Italian plague in the 1600s, the wealthy citizens of Tuscany devised an ingenious way to sell off the contents of their wine cellars without entering the presumably infected streets. Wine windows, or bouchette del vino. <clears throat> Narrow windows were cut into grand homes to allow wine cellars to pass their wares to waiting customers, much like the go-to cocktail windows that popped up in cities like New York during the COVID-19 pandemic. 17th century wine cellars even used vinegar as a disinfectant when accepting payment. 
There are over 150 wine windows in the city of Florence, and 400 years after the plague, they were revived amid COVID-19 to serve customers everything from wine and coffee to gelato. Number three is mask wearing. Doctors treating patients during the plague wore masks with long bird-like beaks. They had the right idea. The long beaks created social distance between patient and doctor and at least partially covered their mouth and nose. But the wrong science. Doctors at the time believed in miasma theory, which held that diseases spread through bad smells in the air. The beaks were often packed with strongly scented herbs believed to ward off illness. <clears throat> During the 1918 influ influenza, masks became the go-to means of stopping the spread of infection. <clears throat> Number four, washing hands and surfaces. Washing your hands to reduce the spread of disease is an accepted part of hygiene now, but frequent hand washing was a bit of a novelty during the early 20th century. To encourage the practice, powder rooms or ground floor bathrooms were first installed as a way to protect family from germs brought in by guests and delivery people dropping off goods like coal, milk and ice. Previously, these visitors would have to have traveled through the entire home to use the bathroom, tracking outside germs with them. Typhoid Mary infamously spread the disease from which she earns her name by not properly washing her hands before handling food. Germ theory was a relatively new concept brought to light in the mid-1800s by Louis Pasteur, Joseph Lister, and Robert Koch that held that disease was caused by microorganisms invisible to the naked eye. Having a sink on the ground floor made it easier to wash your hands upon returning home. And number five, fresh air and adaptive schooling. In 1665, a young Isaac Newton was sent home from Cambridge University to his family's farm following an outbreak of the bubonic plague. Fresh air was used to help contain the tuberculosis outbreak in the early 1900s. Germany pioneered the concept of open air schools and by 1918, over 130 American cities had them. The movement towards fresh air also inspired city planners to create more green spaces to promote public health. During the second wave of the Spanish flu outbreak in the fall of 1918, public schools in Chicago and New York stayed open. At the time, New York City's health commissioner told the New York Times, children have to leave their often unsanitary homes for large, clean, airy school buildings where there is always a system of inspection and examination enforced. The COVID-19 pandemic is the first time that much of our world have faced the sudden, unseen, an unremitting fear of an easily spread and deadly infectious disease. Such a crisis can spur terrified citizens to blame each other for the suffering. It can exacerbate existing social and economic divisions. It can even destroy societies. To paraphrase Michelle Obama, pandemics don't make your character, they reveal your character. As long as we do what we can to keep ourselves and others safe, this too shall pass.